Thank you, Rose. Yeah, you need to pray for Pastor Adam and Tara. They're suffering in Mexico right now. And um, we're glad for them because when they get back, they're going to be busy. And uh, we're just grateful for them as our pastors and pray God's rich blessing on them. I hope they're on your prayer list that you bring before the Lord every day. And um, so, yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can gather around the Word, that the Word is important to us. It'll speak to us, Lord. And, um, and so we just choose to hear what you have to say today. Lord, we captivate our thoughts and um, Open our hearts to you. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Last week we finished Daniel chapter 2. And um, in it, we know that the, um, the wise people, I'm going to say the wise guys, the astrologers and whoever they all were, of, of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were included in that group. They had been uh, captives from, from Jerusalem, from Israel, and they'd spent three years in study. So in the Babylonian school of astrology and idolatry and whatever their business plans were. Um, and so they studied there. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was, he was like the ultimate in that area. Babylon was the, the seat of power, as it was uh, in that time. And so, here's the king. Now, the king had a dream. Now, their whole system was that they, they depended on these astrologers, these fellows who consulted wooden gods or somebody to give them some ideas. And so Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he said to these guys, I want you to tell me about my dream. They said, oh yeah, okay, tell us your dream and we'll, we'll interpret it for you. And he said, no, 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 I don't trust you guys. I mean, figure it out. He wasn't that stupid. He's saying, you know, you're the, guy, you're the guys that, that pray to a wooden god or something of stone. You bow down. You do all kinds of whatever. And, you know, you look at the astrologers and you're looking at uh, trying to interpret the signs around them, whether it's in the sky, in the sky or wherever. And, um, and he said, you know what? You basically just tell me anything. And he said, we're not doing that. This is important. You tell me my dream what it was, and then you tell me the interpretation of it. And they said, oh, hey, wait a minute. Like, we, we can't do that. And so here we have a dilemma. In chapter 2, we find that Daniel and his three friends were given places of, of um, importance because of where they were at with, with um, interpreting, presenting the, the dream accurately enough for him to be happy with that and then for the interpretation of it. And so he gave them large places within the structure of, of their governments. And so they were, rec God was recognized. Their Nebuchadnezzar recognized the God of, of the Hebrews. Then we get into chapter 3. Well, in chapter 3, Daniel and his three friends, so they were, they were young men, and, the, and we find out that they were probably about 18 years old at the time of the dream interpretation, 
And now we find that it's in chapter 3 is like 16 years later. So these guys are like 34 years old around that area. And so that's the setting of today. And Daniel 1, sorry, 3 verse 1. And um, I'm going to read quickly through. Now I'm going to go down to about the seventh, chapter, seventh verse. But, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, perfects, prefects rather, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial of officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So we find out that here in their, their whole system of, of governance and you know, getting knowledge and what have you, was they were idol worshipers. So if you go back into chapter 2, and we mentioned this earlier, but 247, King said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, uh, sorry, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were, una for you were able to reveal this mystery. Though he was impressed with the God of the Hebrews, Nebuchadnezzar, N nor the people, never converted, but continued in our idolatrous ways. The image or idol that Nebuchadnezzar set up was 60 cubits. Now, I'm going to cross the whole congregation here, okay? Some of you know what cubits are. Or 90 feet. Some of you know what feet would be. Or 27.4 meters for the rest of you who are younger than me by six cubits, or nine feet, this is the width, or 20, uh, sorry, 2.74 meters. Now, the six, 60 cubits by six, the number of man is six, okay? So, there we go. It seems to be reasonable that this idol would be a shape of a man. The idol was, says it was an idol of gold. Commentators say that probably wasn't solid gold. So, I mean, this thing's 90 feet high, six feet wide. Um, it's, it's logical that it would be coated in gold, not or plated, not solid. But gold um, <clears throat> indicates superiority and power. Nebuchadnezzar was obviously a strong and effective leader. He was also self-important, pompous, and swayed by men with effusive praise and ulterior motives, like ridding themselves of the Hebrews who had been promoted to be over them and to make them look ineffective. Verse 8, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. 
And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, it is, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? You got to remember, these guys were appreciated by Nebuchadnezzar, being they were in responsible positions in his government. But he was influenced by these because these were the establishment, if you will, as far as his, his advisors, his governance, um, and he had placed these Hebrew guys, these believers in God, into large places within his administration because they had shown himself to be faithful. You remember they had gone through the three years of indoctrination, if you will, in their Babylonian university or whatever, and came out, and I said this last week, but they came out still being believers and followers of God. You know, it's troubling. We send our kids, kids to university, kids, young people who have been raised in the church by Christian parents, and 75% of them at least lose their faith when they go to university. These guys were under huge pressures and they came out, and we're talking about them today, and they were faced with a do or die situation, and they were true to God. So, these guys wanted to free themselves of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They made them look bad. So these astrologers were plotting, and so here's the opportunity. Nebuchadnezzar loved flattery. And some of this was dressed up as good judgment. These guys came along and they presented themselves as being those who have only his best interest at heart. In actual fact, they had their best interest at heart. He made a judgment that had huge implications. You know, when you look at some of his declarations. He says things like, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to be killed. Your houses are going to be just like uh, piles of rock. They're going to be beat to nothing. And that's what's going to happen to those who don't bow down and serve and, and give homage to our God. Satan is no different. You know, he would destroy you. He would destroy your best intentions. He would destroy what God intends to do. John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes, and they're talking about, the, about, about Satan, only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I don't know if many of you watched um, Robert Morris this morning. He said, I'm going to give you some really deep theology. He said, two, two things. And he said, you can take this in light of all kinds of wordage of theology. He said, God, good, Satan, bad. I thought, if we could get that firmly implanted in our spirits, God is good. He's always good. Satan is bad. He's always bad. It says that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus is talking here, and he said, I have come that you can have life not just a little bit life, but life to the full. King James says life, abundant life. So who do we serve? John 8, 44, going back a couple chapters, or verses rather, or chapters, says in 8, 44, says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, he, for he is a liar 
and the father of lies. When you read through the scripture that we're talking about in Daniel, and I know in, you get into chapter 6 and so on, it's, it leans really more heavily into, into prophecy. But as you read this, Daniel is, Daniel is promoting to us that God, the God of heaven, is victorious over all of the work of the devil. He's victorious. Daniel 3.15 says, Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown, in, thrown into the furnace, blazing furnace, the God we serve will be who is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I like what they said, verse 16. Hey, king, shake your head, man. We don't, this isn't even a matter of discussion. We're not, we're not even talking about it. We're not defending ourselves in why we do this. We're just not doing it. Because if God isn't going to deliver us somehow, hey, we're good. We win. If we, if we die, we're with God. If he delivers us, we win each way. And so, three years, and now 16 more years, but their faith, I mean, you've got to admire these guys, right? This is not just a, a fairy tale story here that, for a children's book. This is God's word telling us truth. We have an enemy. And he, he's our enemy because he's God's enemy. Am I right? He's our enemy because he's God's enemy. And if he's God's enemy and we're children of God, guess what? He's our enemy. And he wants you to fail. We may never be so overtly challenged by the devil. We may never face a fiery furnace. But I gotta tell you, the day we live in, I mean, there's, there's so much stuff. It's camouflaged in so many different ways. You should be kindly toward whatever, whatever cause. And if you just relax your thinking a little bit, and I'm going to tell you what, this has happened within our churches, in not specifically our church, but in, within the church community. And there are churches who have softened their stands on sin in lots of ways. And people have said, yeah, you know what? I mean, we should be accepting of everybody. Well, you know, true, we should love people. We do. We love people, but we don't love their sin. God doesn't love their sin, but Jesus died. He's not willing that any perish, but that everyone comes to repentance. Everyone. You know, the broken, the, the sexual deviants, all the people who have whatever the cases are, okay? And we can, we can talk about that a lot. God wants to save them. He wants to redeem them. He wants to heal them. He wants to restore them. And, and you know what I believe? We as churches sometimes, maybe us as a church, some, maybe us as, as believers, maybe us as family members, 
we can get quite a bone in our neck about some of these things. But we need to love these people. Jesus loves them. He doesn't love their sin. He loves them. We as a church love them. We don't love their sin, but we love them. It's really quiet in here. I don't think many of us would want what God has forgiven us of to be somehow painted on us that everybody could read it all the time. Am I right? Okay, don't say no. Don't nod at me. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you what. (laughs) I believe it's true. I wouldn't... I'm so glad. He said, I've taken your sin away. It's as far as the east is from the west. I've taken it away from you. And, and not to be remembered against you anymore. And the devil would come to us and say, I remember what you did. And, hey, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Yeah, but it was really bad. I'm forgiven. Did you get it? I'm forgiven. Yeah, but, yeah, but. I I know where all I speak, okay? So I know you guys aren't all that pure. I know that God has forgiven us. And because of that, we stand before him righteous. Like we've never sinned. But the devil, the enemy of our soul, would try and remind us. And here we see exactly these kinds of things. And when the enemy comes along to us and says, you know what, if you just bow down to whatever ideology. And I think, you know, okay, so if, if, if these guys had just lay down on the ground for five minutes... It wasn't just a matter of that. It was a matter of, of, of what it would have indicated. They'd have been capitulating their faith, right? They'd have been giving up their faith. They'd have been succumbing to the lies of the devil. And where would have gone? But you know what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5? It says, you shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above, heaven above or in the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents as the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. But you shall not bow down and worship them. Saying, Lord, I need your spirit, I need your power, I need your anointing. And Lord, you've got to help me to be discerning. You think the Spirit of God is discerning? Oh yeah, he's discerning. The devil doesn't pull any wool over his eyes. And when this stuff comes along, to discern between, do I love this individual or am I going to somehow be accepting of the sin? We get told, essentially, you have to be accepting of the sin by society. Otherwise, what kind of person are you? Oh, yeah, you're religious, what have you. No. We love them because Jesus died for them, just like he did for us. We've got nothing to brag about. Well, maybe some of you do. But most of us have nothing to brag about. Where we've come from, you know, I hate to say, even the best of you, Okay, and I'm saying of you, even the best of you, no matter how you've lived, your heart wasn't given to Jesus. You don't have a hope of heaven unless your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because I said, Jesus, come into my heart. I believe in you as Lord and my Savior, and I want you to be Lord of my life. And now my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when I stand before 
Jesus, he's going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? He's going to say, oh, yeah, right, okay, there's your name. Yes, come in. We've got that forgiveness. We've got that relationship. And others need that as well. Okay? You shall not make yourself an image. You'll not bow down. On looking back, have you ever been tempted to sin by something that seems acceptable? And that's what we talked about a little bit earlier. Maybe it opens a door. Maybe it gives us favor. Maybe it, you know, we think that's an acceptable thing for us to give assent to some things. We love the sinner. We don't love the sin. We guard our hearts. We say, Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit dwells within you. Holy Spirit will reveal to you the things that you need to stay away from. Have you ever succumbed to peer pressure? Have you ever succumbed to, have you ever endured peer pressure? You know, you've been around people, people in the world, and <clears throat> there's peer pressure. God is our strength. Daniel 3.19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward him cha them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So this furnace might have been, its primary intent and uh, purpose might have been for the smelting of iron, okay? Taking iron ore and smelting it and making iron instruments and so on and so forth. But it also was used as, a, as, a, as an instrument of throwing some of their enemies or those who were, were transgressors. Um, and and he heated it seven times hotter. Now, Nebuchadnezzar lost his temper. And somebody said, there's no fool on earth like the person who has lost their temper. <laughs> Ever lost your temper? Ever had to go back and repent? Say you're sorry? And what did you say? Sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I don't know what got over me. I was angry, and I, I, I wasn't, I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, there's no fool on earth like the man who's lost his temper. And if Nebuchadnezzar really wanted to, to, to punish these guys, you know what he should have done? He should have made that furnace not so hot. You can imagine, you know. They got thrown into the furnace. Even the guys who threw them in there died. So if they had been not under the protection of God, they'd have had, they'd have been smoked just like that. Their turbans and their, all of their clothes. And I mean, Scripture says that, and, it, and yeah, it would have been a, a far, more di far more difficult death if that fire hadn't been nearly so hot. We serve God, who's all-knowing, he's all-wise, he's all-powerful, he's ever-present, and he's all-loving. The devil is none of these things. And Nebuchadnezzar, he was, a, he, was a, he was showing us how the devil goes. His nature was showing clearly in Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 23 says, And these men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. 
And King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisor, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, perfects, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. I don't know about you, I read this, and just a thought. Why didn't Nebuchadnezzar say, and I want to talk to the fourth guy too. Wouldn't have you? I mean, maybe that wasn't possible, but I think, man, if I'd invite these guys out, there'd be such a miracle, and there was four guys in there. I'd say, oh, four of you guys come out, I want to talk to you. I'd be very interested in having a face-to-face -face with the fourth guy. Fourth guy in the furnace. The ropes that bound them were burned off, but they were totally untouched themselves. All their clothing, everything. Isaiah 43, 1 says, up to 3, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. You guys have probably memorized this over and over, and I hope you have. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Here's the key, verse four, verse three, rather, chapter 43 of Isaiah. For I, the Lord, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Verse 28 of Daniel. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defeat, defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I declare that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their house be turned, houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king of Shadrach, sorry, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Nebuchadnezzar expressed his recognition of the God of Shadrach, sorry, of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as powerful deserving of reverence, but he never abandoned his idolatrous ways and made their God to be his God. This isn't unusual, right? I know many people give assent to God as creator to Jesus as Savior, a Savior, the Savior of Christmas and Easter. They believe in heaven, but they don't personalize it. But you know when they're getting ready to die or when they do die, and, and you know what their families say? They've gone to a better place. Have you ever been around that? You've gone to a better place. 
something rises up inside of me and I'm saying, sorry, sorry. But that's not true. It's not true. All, dog, all good dogs don't go to heaven. Unless you invite Jesus into your heart, Scripture says, if you look in Revelation toward the end, in, unless their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, he said, go away from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. But God is merciful. And I know people that have gotten saved on their deathbeds, live like hell their whole lives. You know, and at the time we came down, they received the truth of the gospel, invited Jesus into their hearts. And that's what Jesus does. That's what God does, okay? He wants us to live for him and serve him and be fruitful and productive for him throughout our lives. No question. Remember the guy that had a vineyard and he hired people to come at every hour of the day. And the truth of the story was that the one that came at the end of the day got paid just as much as the one who came at the start of the day. Now, the guy at the start of the day had a lot more attributable to him as far as what he had accomplished. And I want to say, Lord, when I stand before you, I got, I mean, I don't have any problem with somebody getting saved. I'm so glad that somebody gets saved in the last hours or minutes of their lives. No two ways. And God is gracious. And the mercy that he's extended to us applies to those people. And I'm so glad for that. But there are lots of people that say, yeah, I mean, how could you not believe in God? Look at, look at the wonders around us. Look at creation and all these kinds of things. You know, the scripture says that when, when the, the multitudes came after Jesus and, and they were there like the 4,000 and the 5,000 and more, way, more, way more people than that. But th those people that were partakers of the, of, the, of the multiplied fish and loaves, it didn't take very long and they left him. Because they never invited them, him to be their personal savior. And so we can talk about, we can go to church, Christmas and Easter. We can have somebody say at our funeral, yeah, they were pretty good people. I've told you the story about Phil, my old friend. And the, Lord, and, the, and, the, and the pastor said, you know, he, I'm sure he's in heaven because he was nice to dogs. He lived like hell. He was a good guy. I liked him. He was an old alcoholic, truck driver, logging truck driver. And the pastor preached him into heaven because surely God would be merciful to him because he had a good side to him. And that's not what the Bible says. Scripture says, except a man be born again except we invite Jesus into our hearts. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Nebuchadnezzar, it's not even a point of discussion. We're not doing that. And I trust that the Holy Spirit would empower you. Empower you. That's what it does. Holy Spirit... He, that's what he does. Empowers us to live godly in a godless generation. And he's here this morning. And if, you know, if you're a follower, you know about God. You know about God. But you've never invited him into your life and given him everything. You know, God loves you. You think, I'm doing pretty good managing my own life. You know what? Sorry. That doesn't work that good. And, and don't, you know, maybe you've got to say it louder. I don't know. But the, the aspects of following God, therein lies a security and him, you know, you can, he can lead you. You can have that hope of heaven. You know you're forgiven. You can tell the devil, it's not even a point of discussion. I will not bow down when I go through the fire. And you know what? Sometimes we think that 
Life has to be perfect. Scripture says, when? It says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Do you need a miracle this morning from God? Do you need something to change in your heart first off? This is the best day, the best day in your whole life for that to happen. And is it complicated? No. Do you have to do penance? No. Do you have to? No. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to invite you into my life. I want to give you all of the junk of my life. I want it to be that I can say, it's not even a point of discussion whether I'm going to not serve God faithfully, whether I'm going to bow down to something of this world. It's not even a discussion because my track is set. I'm going to serve God. You know, we were driving the other day, and you know, you think about the goodness and the greatness of God and how, how big He is and how mighty He is. And sometimes we wonder, does God really care does really, does God, can he, can he know what's going on in my life? And we're driving down the road and down the, down the street here, there's a whole bunch of trees on the right-hand side of the road as you're heading toward town. And those leaves were starting to all come out. Every tree. And trees everywhere. We're starting to get leaves and starting to turn green. And I was impressed with, I'm a little bit simple in my head maybe, but I, I was impressed with the fact God didn't have to. God did that, right? Because everybody says, you know, God is wonderful. Look at the flowers. Look at the leaves. Look at, you know, all of these kind of things. We attribute that, and it's God's creation. He created it. And I said to Myrna, I said, you know, isn't it cool? God doesn't have to go to every tree and say, okay, start making green leaves. Start making green leaves. Start making green leaves. And flowers start to grow. And I remember asking God about a need I had one time. It wasn't super big. Lord, how can you care? about me and my little need. And you know what he said? Because I can. Just like he doesn't have to go and restart those trees every year. He cares for me. He cares for you. And my intention is I will not bow down. I'm not going to sacrifice what God has done. I'm not going to wipe my feet on what God, I'm not going to, I'm not going to treat as cheap what God has done for me. I want to embrace it. He said, and we need a miracle this morning. We're going to have the prayer team come. I said, we, 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 we believe in prayer. Matthew 18, or sorry, 11, 28 says, come to me all you are heavy and, heavy and weary and burdened. Sorry, come to me all you are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn of me for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's stand, if you will. We're, we're going to sing another song. And you know what? If you've never really made Jesus Lord of your life, you know about him and you know you like him, and, and you know what? If you've never really given your heart to him, this is a good morning to come. If you have a need, if you need a miracle, and I know we've had prayer, I, I, I'm not, you know, if, if you need a miracle, we got people who know how to pray, and we want to pray for you. Father, I thank you today you're in this place 
And Lord, you have a purpose for our hearts. You got a purpose for us to serve you, and we want to serve you. We want to be children of the Most High God. We recognize that God is good, and the devil is bad, and he'll bring nothing but death, destruction, horror in our lives. Lord, we want you to show yourself in us. And so, Lord, give us even the courage maybe that it takes to come to receive from you. Go with us, Lord. Be blessed in Jesus' name. So if you need a prayer, come forward. We're going to sing one more song, and then Pat's going to close our service in a word of prayer.